I want to uh, tell you today about three areas of science and engineering that I think are converging in, in very interesting ways. Uh, I'm a, a mechanical engineer. I've been working in robotics for over 25 years. I've been in micro and nanotechnologies for over 15 years. And over the past decade, since I've been here in Zurich, I've been working more closely with biologists and with medical doctors. And I think the, the, the technologies we're working on and our vision over the future has some very interesting uh, implications. But instead of telling you about it, what I want to show you is a clip from a Hollywood film that actually happens to be almost as old as I am. So. Fantastic Voyage, it's a classic, I, I love this movie. Uh, Hollywood has two advantages when they make movies versus an engineer. Uh, they don't have to worry about physics. They don't actually have to make the things, okay? So what I want to show you now is a, an animation actually made for us by the Discovery Channel. They visited my lab about a year and a half ago. Uh, we appeared on one of their, uh, their, their shows and uh, they put together kind of this concept of where we're heading. And what we've been working on for several years now have been uh, little, what we call micro robots that we inject into your eye. Uh, we, we haven't done it on a human yet, but uh, uh, you inject into your eye and we use, electro, we use magnetic fields to guide that device back to the retina to perform certain retinal therapies, for instance, delivering drugs. You saw there over the patient the, um, uh, the sequence of electromagnetic coils that we use. And this is actually in a real pig's eye that you're seeing right here. Now this pig's eye actually came from the butcher earlier that morning, so we didn't uh, harm any animals ourselves in making this. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, what, what, what you see is that we're able to very precisely control that device. That device is about a half a millimeter in size, about a millimeter long to give you an idea of scale. Uh, and, and in this next uh, slide you'll see on the left is, is uh, the a system of electromagnetic coils we use. We do in vivo uh, animal trials with these. There, there are eight of these coils, we call it the Octomag, and we control the current in each one of those very precisely to guide this device through the ocular cavity back to the retina. You'll see one of our devices is one of our most recent devices on the fingertip there. That particular, we call it a micro-robot, it's about a, a third of a millimeter in, di in diameter, 330 microns in diameter. And our design specs, the reason we want it to be so, so thin, it's about 1.8 millimeters long, is that we want it to fit inside of a 23 gauge needle. If it fits inside of a 23 gauge needle and we inject it into your eye, as we remove that, that, that uh, puncture wound doesn't need a uh, suture. It's, it's relatively uh, non-invasive. You just put a little topical anesthetic and it, it's done all the time to inject drugs to treat uh, uh, age-related macular degeneration. That, that needle, not the ro micro-robots, I should say. But that, that robot that I just showed you, that you see there on the fingertip, is the biggest robot we make. My goal is to make robots that are about a thousand times smaller than that. Something the size, for instance, of these E. coli bacteria, these little rod-shaped bacteria, are about a micron or two long. That is about a hundredth of the width of a hair. You see those little uh, uh, tails coming off of them. We'll get to that later, okay? But before we, we start talking about bacteria, I want to talk a little bit about physics and, and what these constraints put on us. So we're going to do a simple thought experiment here. Let's take uh, a cube, okay? It's a meter on a side, and I don't need my calculator to do this calculation. A meter by a meter by a meter is a cubic meter, right? But if I take that cube and I shrink it to 10 centimeters, I shrink it by a factor of 10, that calculation changes because I'm taking a length by a length by a length, and all of a sudden it's become a thousandth of, of the, its original volume. And so properties that depend on uh, volume, for instance mass, also go down by a factor of a thousand. Now if I go down another hundred times to a centimeter, it's gone down now by a million times. And so volume, as I said, the weight of it goes down by a million times, but also those magnetic forces we generate it generate on it are also going down because they scale also with the mass of the object. So you might say, well, that, but, but since it, it weighs less, what's the problem? But now let's think about the surface area of that cube. It's got six sides. Each side is a square meter. It's got six square, six square meters on that cube over the volume of one ratio of six. But as I go down, that area is only a length by a length. And so as I go down, each order of magnitude by a factor of 10, the, the importance of surface area goes up by a factor of 10. And that causes problems, okay? I can't make robots and guide them with magnetic fields the way I showed you uh, in the eye. Uh, I can't make them any smaller than I, than I have. 
So, what are some of the implications? Well, think about a fish and how a fish swims. A fish moves its tail back and forth in a, in a reciprocal motion. It's pushing the fluid back, uh, the, uh, the mass of fluid back, and moving itself forward. It knows Newton's first law. Okay. And so Jeffrey Taylor, professor at Cambridge, uh, thought about this and published some very important papers in the 1950s, and he made a little mechanical fish uh, just to show how it would work in water, and it swims just the way you think it would. But if I took that fish, or I took you, and I made you 1,000 or 10,000 times smaller, and I put you in water, all of a sudden that water would feel, even though it's got the same viscosity, the surface effects, would, the drag of that water would be much, much stronger on you. And so what, what Jeffrey Taylor did, this is a video he made in the 1960s, is he got a vat of uh, something very thick. Uh, I think if you're from the UK, you know Lyle's Golden Syrup, and I think that's what he must have used if you look at it. So uh, he took his robot, uh, his little, I don't know, robot, it's a little mechanical fish, put it in there, and, and uh, it doesn't go anywhere. Because the fluid drag is so strong and the mass it's pushing, pushing back is so much less than that that it doesn't move. And that's the problem as we go down in scale, is that we, um, we have to think uh, rethink the way things swim and the way things move. Well, of course, if you're an engineer and you don't know how to solve a problem, what do you do? You look at nature and you think, well, how did nature solve this problem? Nature solved this problem millions, billions of years ago. We know there's paramecia. We see the spermatozoa there on the right. And they have these special little hairs on them, these cilia, these uh, uh, flagella for the sperm we call them, that move in very interesting ways. Now, nobody knew before 1675 that these things even existed. Anton von Leeuwenhoek was looking in, in Holland, was looking at his microscope, and he was astounded to see a world of tens of thousands of little microorganisms swimming. He wrote a letter to the Royal Society the next year. They verified his results. People were, were astounded at what was going on. And he actually saw what, what uh, von Leeuwenhoek saw in his microscope was the first time anybody had ever seen bacteria. This is... Uh, one of those rod-shaped, a, a, a graphic of one, it's about a micron or two long. Um, and as you look at these under a microscope, you saw the one I showed of the, of the E. coli, you'll notice it has a, a little flagella on it. And as you look at under a microscope, what you see is this, this flagella seems to be wiggling back and forth. But if you were able to look at it from another direction, you realize it's not wiggling back and forth, it's actually rotating. And Howard Berg, when he was at uh, Col University of Colorado in the 19, early 1970s, discovered this. And what he discovered was, was astounding. Nature has invented a rotary motor. Think about it. What, what else, where else in nature is there a rotary motor? And uh, uh, Howard uh, has, has been to our lab and given us some advice on what to do. He calls these things nature's micro-robots. Okay? So this, the body of the bacteria has sensors on it, chemoreceptors. Uh, those chemoreceptors communicate with the motor in the back of it to drive it. That also has software in there. The software is the chunks of DNA floating around, which are what, what they're doing is they're just telling it what parts to make to keep building the sensors it needs, the motors it needs, and all that. And the motor is a fascinating structure. Since Howard discovered these bacterial motors in, the 1973, in 1973, which, by the way, some people believe is evidence of, of an intelligent designer, but uh, I don't think most uh, biologists believe that. Um, uh, th these, are, these motors are made from about uh, 30 to 40 proteins. They assemble into this structure uh, that, that spins up to 160 revolutions per second. And uh, you see on the right here a video from Howard's lab of, of fluorescent bacteria uh, swimming uh, at these speeds. Remember that the size of these are a micron or two. So we looked at this and we were thinking, how, what can we learn from this? How can we take advantage of this? So, we, we leveraged some of our, our nanotechnology expert experience to build uh, something we called an artificial bacteria flagella. Now, I can't make that motor yet. That motor is about 45 nanometers in diameter. But what I can make is the flagella of a similar size and shape that a bacteria has. And on, on the front of it there, on the left, you'll see what looks like a head. And what that is is actually a little piece of magnet. And what I can do with, with that magnet uh, is I can generate a torque on it with a magnetic field. And as I rotate that field, and these are very, very low fields, they're about a thousand times less than an MRI field, they start to get it to twist, and as it twists, it propels itself forward, just like E. coli do. So to give you an idea of the scale we're talking about, here's a scanning electron micrograph of a human hair. It's about 100 microns or so in diameter. There's the size of our smallest ABFs. They're about uh, 10 microns, these particular ones. And this is the size of a red blood cell. Okay, so we're about double, our smallest ones are about twice the size of a red blood cell. And here are three of them swimming together, 
you know, sort of a swarm behavior. They look, to me, they look alive. I get excited when, when we do this. I, you know, it, it's, that's why I do robotics. There's nothing more fun than building a machine and watching it move, you know? Um, now, you'll notice these will start to go backwards. I didn't reverse the video. What I did was I just reversed the field. So there's some really interesting fluid dynamics that can be explored here, and it's uh, uh, pretty interesting. And, and one of the things that was exciting to us this year was when we were in the bookstore, we picked up a, a copy of the 2012 Guinness Book of World Records and discovered that we were in the Guinness Book of World Records for the smallest medical robot. So being in the Guinness Book of World Records is great, but what I'm really gunning for is a, I want to Olymp a medal in the next Olympics, and so we're developing synchronized swimmers. So uh, <laughs> these are interesting. What's particularly interesting about these guys is that they're made out of a polymer. They're, they're non-cytotoxic. They don't kill cells. In fact, cells like to grow on them. And we've developed a new, t a new technology that allows us to make some fairly arbitrary shapes here. So in this next little video I want to show you is a, uh, one of our devices, we put a claw on it. And so what it can do, ar go ar do is go around and grab these little, these are six micron diameter beads. So they're about the size of that red blood cell I showed you. Grab those, move them up in 3D, move them up and, and down, and then eventually uh, uh, release them using these fluidic forces. We've also been thinking about other uh, more serious applications as well. Uh, here's one of our devices. We uh, coated it with a fluorescent molecule called calcine. This molecule, uh, uh, you're looking at it in a fluorescent microscope there. Uh, this molecule uh, um, actually is the same molecular weight as a lot of chemotherapy drugs. And, and on, the, on the left, you'll see a, uh, a, a, some red, red cells that are, that are stain, that stained red. Uh, we've, we've discovered as we move this uh, bacteria near those cells and touch them with it, the calcine actually gets taken up by the cells. So this uh, allows us now to, to potentially deliver drugs into individual cells and target individual cells with this kind of technology. The other thing that's cool, I've only showed you a few of these, but we can make armies of these. We can make them by the thousands. We can make about one a second. Uh, we make tens of thousands, put them in suspension. So I think there's some, some interesting possibilities here for the... For, for, for the future of, of where this can go. So let's go back to the bacterial motor. This is a video from uh, Keiichi Nama's lab at the Saka University. He and his group have spent years trying to understand the exact sequence of proteins, how they assemble into this rotary motor. And while I'm not uh, at the point where I can develop the motor, I can develop some of these parts of this device. And so what we're hoping as we move into the future and keep going in this area, we'll learn more and more from nature at these molecular scales and be able to build machines that operate in similar ways and under similar principles. I've, I've been very fortunate to work with some brilliant scientists, uh, uh, brilliant uh, medical doctors. Um, and when you're at the ETH, uh, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology here, uh, you know, I'm an engineer and I walk, walk the hallways where people like uh, uh, Conrad Röntgen who invented x-rays. Uh, Wolfgang Pauli or Albert Einstein, where it's, it's a humbling experience. So I take a little bit of um, uh, comfort uh, in a quote from the, a famous aeronautical engineer from Caltech, Theodore von Karman. And uh, von Karman said, the, the scientist describes what is, the engineer creates what never was. <laughs> okay? So, uh, um, and finally, I want to leave you with one last thought here, and this is from Richard Feynman, the famous physicist from Caltech, who said, what I cannot make, I do not understand. Okay. So thank you very much.